بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Welcome everybody to the Safina Society Nothing But Facts live stream as we are live today on a very very cold Monday but it's sunny out which is a nice thing at least we have some sun and it's cold and I had to steal my uh, little kids like woolly hats because I don't wear those things but it is so cold that I had to seal it. And are we on Instagram too? Yeah. We resume our operation here in which our whole life basically is just reading these nosus or reading these texts. And Ryan and the crew were just at Sheikh Samir's and Nas. He had a, he's such an, unassuming and undervalued in my opinion like he's not given the attention he deserved by student, by people or students of knowledge Sheikh Samad Nas just had a session on the Bayquniya and, and Hadith all that he does in Syria is transmit Hadith and he attends Majadis of Salah and the Prophet peace be upon him and he's now going to Allentown to Maqasid to recite on Monday Tuesday and Wednesday if I'm not mistaken if uh, uh Sunan and Nasa'i. And that's what the ulama do to keep blessings in the, not just blessings, knowledge too. Knowledge, blessing, gatherings, is recite hadiths, read from a book, have these different gatherings, so on and so forth. And there's no end to it. That's the key. When you're young, you think, oh, okay, I'm going to read this, I'm going to finish that. Then you realize the truth is, there's no end to this. It's going to keep going. You just keep doing it over and over and over. There's no end to it. And there's no one, it's not like it's a majlis for youth, only young people. No, everyone sits in these gatherings. Let's now turn to what we're reading here, which is Imam Asiyuti's book on Asbab al Nuzul. And we're on Surah Al Muzammil. And I said this before that there's like one or two hadiths in Asbab al-Nuzul for each surah. There's not a lot. Once you get to Surah al-Baqarah, of course you may have pages, but because there's a lot of ahkam in those surahs, but these surahs did not have a lot of ahkam. So, entry number 982. Now, of course, we're reading from the bottom up. أخرج البزار والطبراني بسند واه عن جابر Bazar and Tabarani are given, are narrating from a sanad that's weak. Wah. Something it's like layin. On Jabr, on the authority of Jabr. So why is he reciting it if it's a weak sanad? Because this is not aqidah and fiqh. In aqidah and fiqh, you don't even look at a hadith that's not hasan or sahih. But this is not aqidah or fiqh. So you can recite them. You can narrate them. Ijtama'at Quraysh fi dar in nadwa faqalat. Quraysh gathered up in, in their abode, their senate, or whatever you want to call it. It's called dar in nadwa. And this Dar and Nedwa was where they met. And when we were, there's an app now, I wish I could remember the name, but it tells you, it maps out for you in Mecca where all the places are. So, but it gives you the current look, like the, the Google Earth shot, but then it has dots, right? If you click on a dot, or it has numbers, and then you look down, the number corresponds with like a house. So, subhanAllah, I'm telling you, the life back then was like a campsite. Like, uh, Abu Jahl lived like 20 steps away from Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr lived like 15 strides away from Dar al Nadwa, which is where they used to meet. It was like everyone lived so close. So, if you imagine nothing other than the Kaaba there, and there were these little homes, and a home, the studio that we're in right now is probably double the size of a house. It was probably something very simple and basic, everyone's home. Right, but that that was for them. That was the norm. Obviously, for us, it's a bit different. But for them, that was completely normal. And so they all lived next to each other. And Dar and Nadwa was one of those homes, the place of where they used to all meet their senate. And he says here that it's Tamat Quraysh fi Dar and Nadwa, وفقالت, and they all said, "Samu هذا الرجل اسما يستر عنه الناس." They said, "Give him a name." 
that will make people leave him, that will make people abandon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay. فَقَالُوا كَهِن They said he's a kahin, he's a sorcerer, right? They said, no, that's not going to work. لَيْسَ بِكَهِن He's not a sorcerer. Like, who, who did he do sorcery upon? There's no sorcery here at all. قَالُوا majnoon. They said, say he's insane. They said, how is he insane when you keep uh, all your money with him, right? All your money you guys keep with him. How is he majnoon? قَالُوا sahir. Said he's a magician. Okay. A kahin is like someone who tells the future, but a magician is someone who does this black magic stuff. I said, Layla is a sahir. He is not a sahir. He's clearly not. He doesn't do black magic. He doesn't do magic on anyone. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This this uh, news reached him, and this was very early on, and he became extremely upset. So he covered himself up in his. He got under the covers. Okay, and that is fatazammal. He got under the covers. You ever get so upset, all you could do is literally you shut down and you go into the couch and you cover up, right? Fatazammal fi thiyabihi. Fatadathara fiha. Fatahu Jibreel. Then Jibreel alayhi salam came. Now remember, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he is at the age of 40. At the age of 40, you have plenty of life experience. You know people. People know you. Everyone knows everyone. Okay? This, everyone knows everybody here. And now all of a sudden, the people that used to trust you, that used to know you, they're now saying all these things about you and they're plotting about you. Okay? Imagine you come out with a claim and then all the friends that you know, everybody that you know, you learn... That they're plotting us to, to call you a different, you know, to ruin your reputation. You'd get sick. You'd physically get sick. فَأَتَاهُ جِبْرِيل Then Jibreel alayhi salam came and he said, يَا أَيُّهَا المزمل. And يَا أَيُّهَا المدثر. And he recited those, and these two surahs came down. Did they come down right away? Maybe not. He doesn't say that. It just over time perhaps. Like, but immediately after that incident. Okay. When this uh, surah came down, oh, you wrapped one, stand in the night, except very little. So the, the solution to this stress, the solution to this anxiety that people calling him names is to hajjud there isn't any of the serious 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 mashayikh except that they have some portion of tahajjud and there was one saying that said Madik never used to recite to hajjud, pray to hajjud but there were, and he used to pray on a cloth so that people don't say he prays to hajjud but the truth about it is that that narration is not the correct one. The correct one is that he always prayed to Hajjud, but he prayed on a cloth so that he wouldn't get marked up. And he did not want to have the reputation of praying to Hajjud. Like he did not want people to know there's something between him and Allah. And every on the, on the first night of every month, he would stay up the whole night. So when people say about Rajab being... Like the Rajab is a night that uh, first of Rajab, there's a hadith of Sayyidina Ali that the first of Rajab is Mujab dawah in it. And some people say that's weak. Well, the truth of the matter is that the Prophet used, uh, said Imam Malik used to stay up on the first night of every Hijri month, which obviously includes Rajab. And he, why would he stay up the whole night? He obviously believed that there was something special about that. قَامُوا سَنَةً حَتَّى وَرَمَتْ أَقْدَامَهُمْ Subhanallah. The Sahaba, listen to this, the Sahaba, in order to strengthen their tahajjud, their ibadah, 
Then Allah Ta'ala commanded them to stay up the night for in ibadah. They stood, they prayed, they would pray the entire night for a year. How many Sahaba were there at the time? Very few. But these, this is the core of Islam. These men are the core of Islam. And there were amongst them, of course, women. They're such as, for example, um, Sumayya, the mother of Ammar, bin, uh, of, um, of Ammar bin Yasir. She was one of the big Sahabiyat, Sayyidah Khadija. They were, uh, they would pray to Hajjud an entire, the entire night, and they did this for a year. Until finally Allah Ta'ala decreased it for them. Why? Because you are not like anybody else. You are the first generation and the first sliver of the first generation. You are the first cut. You are the Prophet's first disciples. The, not what they were called disciples, but in the meaning of that. You have to be different. You are going to exert an effort greater than anybody else. Finally, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala made a takhfif and he lightened the matter by saying faqra'u ma tayassara min recite only what you're able to but i was uh the other day with a with a small gathering and talking about children and how some kids are guided some aren't so one friend of ours did a um an informal study why are some kids good why are some kids not like what can we do is it they go quran sessions what is it exactly they ended up coming with the conclusion that's extremely important. They said all the kids that were good, there was the only commonality was that one or both of the parents were making dua for them in tahajjud. Not just any regular dua, dua in tahajjud. Okay? Dua in tahajjud. Such that that's one of the main reasons they were guided. Okay? And that's extremely important you cannot miss off to hajj if you care about something you have to do to hajj for it you have to ask for it in hajj and, and i don't know i do not see how something is possible unless your risk is haram but if your risk is halal i do not see how it's possible that a person will do to hajj for a matter for a year and not have ijab to dawah i can't imagine how because at some point when you're knocking on the door of the kareem he will either redirect you to what he wants to give you. He'll cure your heart of it. Let's say I'm dying to have, to be friends with so-and-so. And Allah doesn't want me to be friends with so-and-so. Getting up into Hajjah will cause your heart to change. Your heart will align with the orbit of what Allah wants for you. Over time, you will come to love what Allah wants you to love. Or you'll remain making that dua and Allah will give it to you. It's the power of tahajjud. Now let's go to Surah Al-Jinn. You know that in my PhD thesis, I did I'rab of everything. So I did I'rab of, let's say, it's in, in, is fi, but in, Surah Al-Jinn. I treated the Arabic words in the English sentence with I'rab. So if it was part of a preposition, I put, a, I put an I. Surah Tiljin. And for example, if it was the Mubtada, I would say Surah Tuljin. If it was a Mubtada. And if it was, for example, Maful Bihi, he recited Surah Tiljin. Surah Tuljin. Yeah. So, uh, so they, in English, what do they write? Surah Jin? That doesn't make any sense. Right? Surat al jinn At least put the T. But but I was putting the I, the declination, basically. Surat al jinn Surat al jinn Surat al jinn I was putting full I'rab of everything. Imam al Haddad said, someone said to Imam al Haddad, right? Kasra, Fatah, with an I or an O or a U or an A. And the guy, I thought, well, this is, you know, this is how it should be. The professors, first of all, I had two professors. One disinterested, the uh, the the the, quest, the examiners. One was a Salafi who really did not. He was not happy to be in the room. 
but he was a Yemeni Salafi, so he had to be there. I think he was Yemeni or Saudi or something. He was just smoke coming out of his ears. He did not like the topic. He did not like me. And uh, he was so upset. He was like, why did you do this? I said, because it's a preposition. In is a preposition. So I, And in this case, he's the subject. In this case, he's the object, right? He's like, no, redo all this. Right? There's no Arab in English, right? So he got upset. They couldn't find anyone who was really an expert in the subject except Imam uh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Winter, and he couldn't do it because he was all the way in Cambridge. Like you write a subject, you write about Imam al Haddad, Abdullah bin Anu Haddad, and all his books. Who's checking my thesis? People who have never even opened one of his books. Like, what do they know about him, right? So they couldn't find anyone. Uh, you have the charger? When you're done, I'll use it. Okay, thanks. So it ended up being that um, they just checked it for like the academic uh, structure of it, which passed, except that they made me re add one more chapter, which was fine. It was a fun chapter to recite, to do. In any event. Surah al Jin. أخرج البخاري والترمذي وغيرهما عن ابن عباس قال ما قرأ رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على الجن ولا رآهم. The Prophet did not recite upon the jinn according to Ibn Abbas nor did he see them ولكنه انطلق في طائفة من أصحابه عامدين إلى سوق, سوق عكاظ. But the Prophet was with some sahaba going to the market of عكاظ. The Okad market is a huge season in Mecca where all the sellers go. I think it's a little outside Mecca. Now the shayateen and the news of the heavens, the shayateen used to go up and get the news of the heavens and come down. And what would they do with that news? They would get in touch with whoever's in touch with them. We call them oracles, medicine men, magicians, kahins, sorcerers, whatever, these weird people who get in touch with the jinn. Now the jinn are also clever. They got a great pro they got a great product here, which is what? Which is the f news of the future. So they will not give it away for free. So they used to tell these sorcerers part of the news and withhold part. And that's why, with the coming of the Prophet, this is one of the great blessings upon humanity, is that the jinn no longer have access to the future. All these astrologers, medicine men, maybe not medicine men, because that's maybe actual medicine that they had, but oracles, these people, they went out of business because the jinn don't have the news anymore. Right? The jinn don't have the news. This all is one of the gifts that the Prophet was given. Yeah. They were stoned. So they went back to their people and said, now listen to this. The jinn were all of a sudden, they can't go up any further in the skies. They would get pelted. So they said, there must be something that's happening on the earth. That's the reason for this. So the jinn commanded, they said, everyone divide up around the earth and go. See what's going on. So the jinn who ended up were assigned to the Arabian Peninsula ended up going near to the Mecca, Tihama, is here, which is near Mecca. And they found the messenger of Allah under a palm tree. Who is it? Who's knocking? For the other house or for us? I think it's for the other house. Maybe it's Obaldo for the roof. Okay. 
Yeah, salam. Good man. Paying his rent. La renta. Mm. What's he saying, Ray? He's paying the rent. <sighs> That's what's causing that. Anyway. All right. So the gin, sorry for those listening and those who are on Spotify. The gin. Thank you very much. Made a drug deal here. What is this? Okay. Uh, they got to Mecca and they got to this palm tree and it's Fajr and they hear the Quran. They listened closely. This is what has come between you. And being able to access the sky. They went back to their fellow jinn. We heard an astounding recitation. Of course, the word Quran means a recitation. It's amazing that the Quran and the, the Al Medina, right? Al Kaaba, they're literally called what they are. Al Kaaba is Al Muka'ab that block that comes up. That's the meaning of Kaaba. Al-Quran is the recitation. al Medina is the city. They're just called what they are, right? And Muhammad, the praised one, which is what he is too. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى نَبِيهِ قُلْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ So the Prophet ﷺ uh, then received the recitation of Surah Al-Jinn. Okay. وأخرج ابن الجوزي في كتاب صف صفة الصفوة تايبو بسند صفة الصفوة is a beautiful booklet عن س بسنده عن سهل بن عبد الله from سهل بن عبد الله تسري قال كنت في ناحية ديار عاد إذ رأيت من مدينة من حجر منقور في وسطها قصر من حجارة تأويه الجن he says, I was in a place where the homes were made out of stone, in the rocks, in the mountains, and the jinn lived there. فدخلت, I entered into it. فَإِذَا شَيْخْ عَظِيمْ الْخَلْقِ A massive sheikh, massive size. يُصَلِّي نَحْوَ الْكَعْبَ Facing the Kaaba. وَعَلَيْهِ جُبَّتْ سُوف And he had a a woolen frock. فيها طراوة فلم أتعجب من عظم خلق خلقته كتعجب من طراوة جبته. طراوة moisture. I don't know. Moisture that it was moist. I guess to say. So I was surprised by this whole image. Imagine you go into a cave and there's a huge man prank with a wool frock on himself. فسلمت عليه. So I said, Assalamu alaikum. Farad alayhi salam. Said, Wa alaikum assalam. Wa qala ya sahl. He said, Ya sahl. And he knew my name. In al abdana la tukhlaq al thiyab wa inma tukhlaqha rawaih al zunub wa mataim al suht wa in hadhi al jub alayya mundu sub'u mi'at sana laqaytu fiha Isa wa Muhammad alayhim al salat wa salam. Listen to this. He says in it. He says the 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 jubba, it had a good smell to it. I guess that's what he's saying. The frock. He said that it is not the bodies, or maybe it is a moist scent. That's what he's saying. He said, Sahl, it is not the bodies that make. Uh, uh, clothes old تخلق الثياب meaning make it like old وإنما تخلقها rather what makes it old is the odor of sins and wealth that is earned in the haram food food that is eaten that is haram and I have been wearing this cloth this frock for 700 years 
In it, I met Isa and I met Muhammad. And I believed in both of them. Sahil said, who are you? Woman ant. Qala, man alladhi nazalat feehim qul uhiya ilayya annahu istama'a nafru min al-jinn. I'm the one who was with the gathering of people for whom qul uhiya ilayya say I have received revelation that some jinn were listening to the Quran. That he was from the er, those jinn that, so clearly he's not a man, he's a jinn. He was from the jinn who were listening to the Quran and were going around searching for what happened and why is it that the Quran was, uh, uh, the, the, we are pelted in the skies. And he said, I believed in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So obviously he was in the form of a person, but he's a jinn. And the jinn, by the way, they do have similar forms to people. Like they have arms and legs and everything and eyes and ears, but their heads are a bit bigger, and their lips are a bit bigger, and their eyes are a bit bigger. Everything's a little, their proportion is very different than ours. Like we wouldn't find that proportion attractive. They find it attractive. So Allah has done that for a reason so that we don't find each other attractive. If you were to ever see them anyway. وَأَخْرَجَ ابْنُ المنذر وَابْنُ أَبِي حَاتِمٍ وَأَبُو الشَّيْخِ فِي الْعَظَمَةِ عَنْ كِرْزِمْ ابْنِ أَبِي السَّائِبِ الْأَنصَارِ قَالَ خَرَجَتُ مَعَ أَبِي إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ This man says, he's an Ansari. I went out with my father to Medina. فِي حَاجَةٍ وَذَلِكَ أَوَّلْ مَا ذُكِرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ ذُكِرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ You had a need to go to Medina. This was right when the people were mentioning the Prophet, peace be upon him, very early on. So we had to sleep somewhere. We found a shepherd and we slept in his tent. He gave us a place to sleep. In the middle of the night, a wolf came and he snatched a baby sheep. The, the shepherd got up. So he, the shepherd got up and he said, Al-Wadi, and he started talking, yelling. And then we heard a response. Ya Sarhan. And I'm going to recite to you the ayah. He shouted out in the middle of the desert. And another uh, voice shouted out, Yes, Sarhan. Sarhan means you're not paying attention. Then all of a sudden the sheep was brought right to him. The baby sheep was brought right to him. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Saying, received the revelation. What does that mean? That means that out in the desert, their I guess their veils of the of materialism were so lifted. When you're out in the desert, there's very few little human contact. There's little contact with anything material. I don't know how to explain it, but they used to, people of the deserts used to have regular communication with the jinn and in this case what this sahabi is narrating is that obviously is before he became muslim these are coming and he said just muhammad was just being mentioned at that time he said that we stayed with the shepherd the shepherd lost a sheep to a wolf and the shepherd ran out in the desert called out to a jinn and the jinn brought him his sheep back and said to him pay attention right so that's an example of what kind of interaction the humans used to have with the jinn on a regular basis if they were tended to be more cut off from other humans so that their material mind, their material aspect of their mentality is down. And so they're able to communicate with what we would regularly be unseen. And this is this the case of this ayah, you can find that regularly very common circumstance common uh, it's in the tafsir that an Arab would go out and he would have to sleep in the desert all alone so he would shout out who is the chief of the jinn in this area protects me 
and they would protect him, right? From animals, from scorpions, whatever. Like that. They would talk on a regular basis in that fashion. Okay. ibn Sa'd. عن أبي رجاء العطار العطاردي من بني تميم قال بعث رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وقد رعيت على أهلي وكفيت مهنتهم فلما بعث النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خرجنا هرابا فأتينا على فلات من الأرض وكنا إذا أمسينا بمثلها قال شيخنا exactly what I just said to you right he says here that the Prophet, peace be upon him, come out, and I had fled from my family. So when we were in an empty area of land and we needed to sleep, the oldest man with us, Shaykhuna, the old man amongst us, he called out, Inna na'udhu bi'azizi hadha al-wadi. We seek refuge with the chief of this valley, the chief jinn of this valley. Min al-jinn al-layla, from the jinn this night meaning of the jinn, the chief of the jinn, on this night. فَقُلْنَا ذَاكَ فَقِيلَ لَنَا إِنَّمَا سَبِيلُ هَذَا الرَّجُلِ شَهَادَةً أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ مَنْ أَقَرَّ بِهَا أَمِنَ عَلَى دَمِهِ وَمَالِهِ فَرَجَعْنَا فَدَخَلْنَا فِي الْإِسْلَامِ قال أبو رجاء أني لأرى هذه الآية نزلت فيا وفي أصحابي then he said later on, so this man, he goes out and he calls out to the chief and protect us. Okay? And we said, what is this? So someone else says, okay, that this man, that man, his way is to say, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. His way, meaning like this new thing that's going on, that's going on, is to say, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So we're like, okay, we'll do that too. And we entered Islam. Okay? And then the ayah was came, came down. وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْإِنْسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِنَ الْجِنِّ But what would the jinn do? فَزَادُهُمْ رَحَقُ The jinn would, would toy with them. They're not trustworthy. They're not honest. But this was, obviously, the man is just Muslim, right? And they're still doing the old things in jahiliyyah. And then this was obviously uh, made haram for them later on. It's not for, permitted to communicate with the jinn except with a few exceptions. To educate them and to use them to Muslim jinn, righteous Muslim jinn, to fight evil jinn that are bothering humans. But to influence other people, to go see what he's doing for me, things like that. It, you can use them to speak to jinn for small little um, things such as I lost something, things like that, that jinn can help with that. The harmless things. But to influence others or to get an advantage over other people would be haram. وَأَخْرَجَ الْخُرَائِطِ فِي كِتَابِ هَوَاتِفِ الْجَانِ Wow, there's a whole book on the speech of jinn to humans. حَدَّثَنَا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بْنِ مُحَمَّدِ الْبَلَوِي حَدَّثَنَا عَمَارَ ابْنِ زَيْد حَدَّثَنِي عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بْنِ الْعَلَاء حَدَّثَنَا مُحَمَّدِ بْنِ عَكْبَرْ عَنْ سعيد بن جبير أن رجلا من بني تميم a man from Bani Tamim, يقال له رافع ابن عمير. His name is رافع ابن عمير. حدث عن بدء إسلامه. He talks about the beginning of the time of his Islam. قال إني لا أسير برمل عالج ذات ليلة إذ غلب بني النوم. I was traveling in a certain sandy area and I got sleepy. فنزلت عن راحلتي وأنختها ونمت. I got off my my animal. I tied it up. And I slept. Okay, and I sought refuge before sleeping. How? By saying, I seek refuge in the chief of the jinn of this area. Then I saw a dream that night. Rajulan biyadihi hariba, a man with a spear. Yuridu an yadaha fi nahri naqati. He wants to spear my camel. He wants to stab my camel. I woke up. Fazian, فانتبهت فزعاً. I woke up startled. فنظرت يميناً وشمالاً فلم أرى شيئاً. I looked left and right and I was saw nothing there. فقلت هذا حلم ثم عدت فغفوت فرأيت مثل ذلك. I said, ah, oh, it's just a nightmare. So I went to sleep 
and I saw the same dream. فَانْتَبَهْتُ فَرَأَيْتُ نَاقَتِي تَطَّرِبْ وَتَلْتَفِتْ I saw my, my camel is upset and it's moving left and right. وَإِذَا بِرَجُلٍ شَاب كَالَّذِي رَأَيْتُهُ And I, a man, just like the one I saw in my dream, okay, حَرِبْ بِيَدِهِ حَرِبَ وَرَجَلْ شَيْخْ مُمْسِكْ بِيَدِهِ يَدْفَعُ عَنْهَا فَبَيْنَمَا هُمَا يَتَ And he's trying to stab my camel and another man pushing him. Okay, And he says, while this is happening, وَهُمَا يَتَنَازَعَانْ إِذْ طَلَعَتْ ثَلَاثَةُ أَنْوَارْ مِنَ الْوَحْشِ فَقَالَ الشَّيْخَ لِلْفَتَى So there's an old man and an, a young man. They're fighting. The young man's trying to stab and an old man is pushing him away. قُمْ فَخُذْ أَيَّتُهَا شِئْتْ فِدَاءً لِنَاقَةِ جَارِي الْإِنْسِي And he said, the old man said to the young man, he said, go and take any of those uh, animals. And he, sh- he showed there were three animals just appeared. He said, take any of these animals instead of taking the animal of my human guest. فَقَامَ الْفَتَى فَأَخَذَ مِنْهَا ثَوْرًا وَانْصَرَفْ The young man came, took that one of those animals, which was like a bull, and he left. ثُمَّ الْتَفَتَ إِلَيَّ الشَّيْخِ The old man looked at me, وَقَالَ يَا هَذَا أَوْ يُو إِذَا نَزَلْتَ وَادِيًا مِنَ الْأَوْدِيَةِ فَخِفْتْ هَوْلَهُ فَقُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ مُحَمَّدٍ مِنْ هَوْلِ هَذَا الْوَادِ وَلَا تَعُذْ بِأَحَدٍ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَقَدْ بَطَلَ أَمْرُهَا So he said that, O oh you, young man, if you ever come into a valley and you are afraid of what's going to happen because you're all alone and you're in this empty valley, say, I seek refuge in the Lord of Muhammad and don't seek refuge in the jinn because their affair is finished. قَدْ بَطَلَ أَمْرُهَا قَالَ فَقُلْتُ لَهُ وَمَنْ مُحَمَّدْ هَذَا And I said, who is this Muhammad? قَالَ نَبِيٌّ عَرَبِيٌّ لَا شَرْقِي وَلَا غَرْبِي بُعِثَ يَوْمُ الْإِثْنَيْنِ He said, he is an Arab prophet, neither from the east nor from the west, and he was sent on the day of Monday. فَقُلْتُ فأن فَأَيْنَ مَسْكَنُهُ Where does he live? قَالَ يَثْرِبْ ذَاتَ النَّخْلِ يَثْرِبْ The place of palm trees. So the man woke up next morning, he rode فَرَكِبْتُ رَاحِلَةِ حِينَ تَرْقَى لِي الصُّبْحِ وَجَدْتُ السَّيْرِ حَتَّى تَقَحَّمْتُ الْمَدِينَةِ until, And I, I rode the entire day until I arrived at Medina. And who was ever there at the outskirts? The Prophet himself. فَرَآنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ The Prophet saw me first, meaning the Prophet happened to be where this man was entering. فَحَدَّثَنِي بِحَدِيثِي قَبْلَ أَنْ أَذْكُرَ مِنْهُ شَيْءٍ He told me what happened to myself before I mentioned anything to him. وَدَعَانِي إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ And he invited me to Islam. You see how early this is? And Yathrib, the Prophet, is now still inviting people to Islam. This is early on. فَأَسْلَمْتُ So I submitted and I became Muslim. قَالَ سَعِيدِ بْنُ جُبَيْرِ وَكُنَّا نَرَى أَنَّهُ هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فِي and Sa'id ibn Jubair, who's, who's the, one of the most pious Berber tabi'is of Berber origin, he said, and we think that he is the one that Allah revealed, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْإِنسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَزَادُوهُمْ رَحَقًا And there was people of the humans used to seek refuge in people of the jinn. So here you had a, a jinn who had become a Muslim, who had defended this human, and yet told him, this issue of seeking our refuge is done with. We don't seek our protection anymore. There's a new order in town. Now that you have dhikr of the seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly, seeking refuge with us is invalid. Subhanallah. This is the proof that there is a path. Some people say there is no path. That it's just Islam and you have the law and you practice it. So on one hand, both sides are correct. So what is the path? The path 
in the one's hand that the Sharia is not a path. The Sharia is right there in front of us. You can get the law book of Islam. It's right there. There's no changing to it. There's no new law. There's no secondary law. There's no secret law. It's all one law. That we agree with. But there is definitely a path of taraqi al-iman, that your iman can go up. And first, the first part of the path is fighting through your sins. If you have sins, you have to fight through them. So that's like you got to scrape away hard. And then if there's ghafla, that's like fog. You have to remove that fog. And then there's an endless amount of iman that a person could have. There's no limit to iman. And this is in Baghawi's why he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us to the straight path. So he addresses this issue. And he says, okay, we say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. What other path is there? He says, so that is the law and the aqidah is one. It will never change. You're either in it, you believe in it, or you don't. However, once you do believe in it, the guidance, the increase of iman and guidance has no limit in Ahl sunnah Ahl sunnah does not believe that there's a limit. So you could be more guided every day. You can have more nur and iman in your heart every day. That's what they mean by that. And istiqama can have no limit. So he says, وأل, this ayah says, وَأَلَّوْ اسْتَقَامُوا عَلَى الطَّرِيقَةِ If they remain steadfast on the way, the path, لَأَسْقَيْنَاهُمْ مَا أَنْغَدَقَى We will give them to drink a cool and sweet drink. Okay. Now remember though, re- repeat that ayah. That ayah number 16 of Surah Al-Jinn is the proof that there is a path. The more ibadah you do, and you do something unique and different, in, in terms of, in relation to yourself, unique and different in relation to yourself, not in relation to the sunnah. That means, if every single day for the last 10 years you've been fasting every Monday, and you pray a couple sunnahs, and you read 10 pages of Quran, you're going to get the same result. But the day that you say, I want to get a different result, I want a better result, I'm a bit bored of things, I want more, so then you're going to increase your ibadah. Now add charity, or do something else you have to add to that and once you add to that you will get a result better result okay so that's the meaning of you will get a sweet reward okay and this was revealed about Quraysh they had a drought of seven years. They had a drought of seven years. That if they had entered Islam, there that drought would have been lifted. But you have to know, لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ fi. And I'm going to actually look up what Imam al baghawi says about that. لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ fi, Because the reward of our path becomes our new test. Okay. Let's see what Sayyidina Imam al baghawi says. Because this is our go-to tafsir. Ayah number 16 of Surah Al-Jinn وَأَلَّوْ اسْتَقَامُوا اِخْتَلَفُوا فِي تَأْوِيلِهَا فَقَالَ قَوْمٌ لَوْ اسْتَقَامُوا عَلَى طَرِيقَةِ الْحَقِّ وَالْإِيمَانِ وَالْهُدَى فَكَانُوا مُؤْمِنِينَ مُطِيعِينَ The tariq here being اسْتَقَامُوا عَلَى طَرِيقَ meaning al-iman They would have gotten rain لَأَسْقَيْنَاهُمْ مَا أَنْغَدَقَ Much, much rain مَا أَنْغَدَقَ فَقَالَ مُقَاتِلُ وَذَلِكَ بَعْدَ مَا رَفَعَ Muqatil says this is because Quraysh had a seven year drought. وَقَالُوا مَعْنَاهُ لَوْ آمَنُوا لَوْ وَسَّعْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا مَا أَنْغَدَقَ Meaning much of everything good that you want, not just rain. So if they were believers, they would have had much rizq and much of the goodness that they want. And مَا أَنْغَدَقَ is a method. And for a desert person, the greatest wealth is rain. So it's just an example. لَأَنَّ الْخَيْرُ وَالْرِزْقُ كُلُّهُ فِي الْمَطَرِ and he says that all the origin of all goodness is rain. Because rain feeds the crops, crops feed the animals, and with animals you eat and you can sell them and get leather and do all these things. This is as Allah says that if the Bani Israel had established the Torah, 
and believed in Sayyidina Isa and established the Injil, they would be eating from above them and from below them. Meaning you would have so much food. And Allah also says, وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْقُرَى The people of Mecca, آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْ If they had believed and had taqwa, لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ We would have opened up all the blessings of the sky. Now, is there any more haq that Allah has than to be believed in? Of course not. This is the greatest haq. So Allah Ta'ala is luring people with worldly benefits. And that's the proof that if you are not, if you are lacking in motivation, you may seek that motivation by worldly benefits. You may say to yourself, all right, I'm feeling a bit down. I'm feeling a bit low. I don't want to do a bad. I'm lazy. I'm a bit depressed. Well, lure yourself with worldly benefits. And this is the proof. Okay. That you can do that. لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ فِي أَيْ لِنَخْتَبِرَهُمْ كَيْفَ شُكْرُهُمْ فِيمَا خُوِّلُوا This great reward that you will be given as a result of your ibadah, it will become your next test. How will you be grateful? And the fiqh of gratitude is number one. You do not do something, you attribute the ni'mah to Allah. That's the first thing. Because some people attribute the blessing to themselves. I did well, I succeeded. Secondly, you do not do anything haram with it. And if you do that, you have passed the test. But if you do a third thing, you have become from the sabiqeen, which is that you use this ni'mah for the help of others, as well as for yourself, but for the help of others. That's the third part. So two parts fard, one part nafl, extra. وَهَذَا قَوْلُ سَعِيدِ بْنِ الْمُسَيِّبِ Meaning that the, the reward, when, when you want something from Allah and you use that as a motivation and then Allah gives it to you, now you keep in mind now, that's going to be your new test. Are you going to be grateful or not? Okay. على طريقة الكفر والضلالة لأعطيناهم مالا كثيرا ولو وسعنا عليهم لنف لنفتنهم في عقوبة لهم واستدراجا حتى يفتتنوا بها فنعذبهم ربيع ابن أنس and زيد ابن أسلم and كلبي they read this the an opposite way وألا واستقاموا على طريقة and if they stay steadfast on the path of كفر they remained on the path of kufr, then we will open up the gates of blessings upon them so that they could drown in it and be distracted from it and enter more into kufr and disbelief and then we can punish them for it. And that's uh, what we call istidraj. Istidraj is when people find themselves going astray yet also succeeding in the dunya. And that is to almost blind them to the truth so they go further astray. كما قال الله تعالى فلما نسوا ما ذكروا به فتحنا عليهم أبواب كل شيء when they forgot what they were reminded of we opened the door of all things to them but that other ta- opposite tafsir of that is that when they forgot Allah that Allah opened up all the calamities upon them okay وما يو أن وما ذكر ربه يسلك عذاب صادا and the meaning of whoever turns away from the path of his Lord the remembrance of his Lord we we will take him step by step to punishment. How do you take him step by step to punishment? From good, one good thing to the next, to the next, to the next. All these good things to be distract you and make you think you're doing good. And that's istidraj. So we have two things here. So when material blessings come upon a person, you either have two options. Either you're going to be grateful or you're going to go further away uh, uh, against the path. In both cases, that's the reflection of what it is from Allah. If you go away from the path, then it's istidraj. If you become grateful, then it was a gift. Okay. وقال ابن عباس شاقا والمعنى ذا صعد صعد أي إذا مش أي ذا مشقة هذا بن صعدة meaning difficult. قال قتادة لا راحة فيه هذا بن صعدة. Okay, so that is the tafsir of that important ayah. Which is ayah number 16 of Surah Al Jinn. Right, let's see what else the CUT brings for us here. 
وأخرج ابن أبي حاتم من طريق أبي صالح عن ابن عباس قال قالت الجن The jinn said, Ya Rasulullah, إِئْذَنْ لَنَا فَنَشْهَدُ مَعَكَ الصَّلَوَاتِ فِي مَسْجِدِكَ The jinn said, O Messenger of Allah, permit us to pray with you in your masjid. Okay. Allah then revealed, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُ مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Verily, the masajid are for Allah. In 2018, I think it was 2019, 2018, December 2018, which was literally these... Uh, Eve before the coronavirus news really hit there is a man named Abdul Ilah Al-Attas and he had spent some time here in America when I went to Mecca I met him there and he showed me around and one of the places we went to is a place right outside Mecca called Masjid Al-Jinn it's the place where the Prophet assigned that he used to teach the jinn let's see what Bagawi says here قال قتادة كانت اليهود والنصارى إذا دخلوا كنائسهم وبيعهم أشركوا بالله The Jews and Christians when they went into their temples they did things that were considered shirk فأمر الله المؤمنين أن يخلصوا, يخلص يخلصوا لله الدعوة And Allah commanded the Muslims, the believers to purify their call to Allah إذا دخلوا المساجد وأرادوا بها المساجد كلها قال الحسن أراد بها البقاع كلهم كلها لأن الأرض جعلت كلها مسجدا للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. Okay, that's separate. This is what we're looking for. قال سعيد بن جبير قالت الجن كيف لنا أن نأتي المسجد وأن نشهد معك الصلاة ونحن ناؤون. They asked, how can we come to the pray with you in your mosque? Okay, then this verse was revealed. وأن المساجد لله. These masajid are not owned by anyone. They are Allah's. وَرُوِيَ عَنْ سَعِيدِ بِنْ جُبَيْرِ أَيْضًا أَنَّ الْمُرَادْ بِالْمَسَاجِدْ الْأَعْضَاءِ الَّتِي يَسْجُدُ عَلَيْهَا الْإِنسَانِ وَهِيَ سَبْعَ Another word for masjid may be the limbs that you pray upon. Okay, but point being is that uh, they wanted to enter the masjid and they said, it's your masjid, what can we do? And, and the, Allah revealed the masjid are for Allah. Which um, is basically a permission for them. And then the next ayah was saying that the, the, the Christians and the Jews would say things that were kufr in their masjid. So the b- believers were commanded, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Do not call anyone upon anyone besides Allah. Okay. And the jinn then said, masjid? How can we enter the mosque? How can we enter your mosque and we are um, separate from you? He said, Masajid are for Allah. And in another one, he says, Akhraja uh, ibn Jarir an. حضرمي أنه ذكر له أن جنيا that a jinn from the jinn uh, from the nobles of the jinn he had followers قال إنما يريد محمد أن يجيره الله وأنا أجيره فأنزل الله قل إني لا لن يجيرني من الله أحد this jinn said uh, he want, I will protect Muhammad and then Allah revealed قل إني say O Muhammad say, إِنِّي لَنْ يُجِيرَنِي مِنَ اللَّهِ أَحَدٌ No one will guard me except Allah. Amazing story in Surah Zid. Now, Masjid al-Jinn is where the Prophet ﷺ educated the jinn. He would teach the jinn there. It was a spot. In Ibn Abbas, it is said it was Ibn Abbas. Others said it was Ibn Umar, but I heard it was Ibn Abbas. Wanted to go and witness this. So the Prophet ﷺ drew a line in the sand. He said, don't pass this line. So Ibn Abbas would just look and all he saw was the Prophet talking. He didn't see the opposite side. Uh, this is the stories of related to Al-Jinn and Surah Al-Jinn. Okay. Let us now turn to your Q&A for the day and see what you all have going on. 
All right, right. Give me something from Instagram because I can't see the Instagram here. Mm. Okay. Is it? Are we? We are though, on though, right? Okay, good. All right. Open Q and A now. Uh, join our classes at arcview.org. Your journey to knowledge. It's virtual and recorded classes. And we are um, get these recorded classes and these recordings um, available right away. As soon as you sign in, you can get all the recordings. All right, all right Muhammad Munim says, is a wife allowed to look through her husband's phone without permission? What about vice versa? Technically, the answer to that is no, because it is your property and it is her property. Their wife does have private property. The husband has private property. Okay. Shoot. Yeah. Awalim is both the Sunday class that we do from two to five is in person and is part of ArcV Plus. It's also live, so you can get it if you're um, if you're out of town. Manar says, what is the Madaki point of view on scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah? Uh, the Madaki don't have any business with Ibn Taymiyyah. His usul are different. There is one overlap is his work on the virtues of, or the concept of Am al Ahl al Medina and the virtue of Medina and its people and its precedent. But other than that, in Aqidah, they differed greatly with the, some of the sayings of Ibn Taymiyyah on the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, his fiqh, to begin with, is Hanbali fiqh, so there's no connection there. And even his fatawa, he has his own fatawa within the Hanbali madhab. And the fatwa of Ibn Taymiyyah is not the ruling of the Hanbali madhab, it's just the fatwa of Ibn Taymiyyah. So, uh, Wali al Tijani, he's now a Tijani. Okay, he's no longer a Shadli, I guess. F. Khan says, if a Muslim jinn is helping you, does that mean you can communicate with it if there's there to help you? No, we don't really have that, to be honest with you, um, in our religion that you go and try to communicate with the jinn and get them to help you. We, it's not really our thing. So I would just stay clear from that, all of it. Can dua truly change the qad that Allah has written for you? The answer is yes, and in different ways. In different ways. Number one, it can completely alter it. Number two, it can block it for you. So that if something is coming down upon you that's bad, your dua becomes a roof. First, it's an umbrella. But an umbrella has limits, right? It's going to be weak eventually. It can be a roof. Then it could. Then roofs are not all the same. Some roofs are stronger than others, right? So your dua can be that the qadr came down upon you, but you didn't feel a thing of it because you have a roof, just like you don't feel any of the elements when you're indoors. And the other meaning is that it can increase it or decrease it. Okay, It could increase your risk or decrease your risk. So all of those are the ways in which al qadr wal qadr can alter. And isn't this a completely theoretical discussion? Because you don't know what your qadr is anyway. None of us see our book of deeds and say, oh, this is going to happen, let me make dua. But there is some time where it could happen. For example, if someone is given a ru'ya saliha, a true dream of this, if some incident that's going to occur. He, his dua and his ibadah can transform that into A, it could delay it, it could push it away a little bit, or it could decrease it, or it can completely uh, like cover it up or even make it sweet for him it can make it sweet it can make it good Allah can make something very difficult to become very easy all by ibadah and dua okay is it permissible for a man to have two wives in separate countries permissibility I can tell you that it is yes it is permissible to as long as it's not in the contract that you will not spend time with her right 
then yes, then that's a situ just a situation that the situation disallows me to be in both two places at once. But yeah, there are many shiuch people in the past that have had married in two different countries. Imran Asim, is it a practice amongst the righteous to recite the ayah Inna alladhi farad alayk al-Qur'an ala radduka ila ma'at? It is a practice to recite that when you leave a place so that in hope that you will recite you return again. Yeah, that's it. Just because of the meaning of the verse. Afghan, can you use a jinn to help you get rid of a kafir jinn? That's what the Muslim scholars do when they deal with the jinn. They use the Muslim jinn to get rid of the non-believing jinn. I remember being told in my youth that they had backward feet. So if you look at a person, look at their feet. See if he's a fake jinn or something. I don't know about that. Yeah, check your toes real quick to make sure you're not a jinn. Uh, I don't know anything about that, to be quite honest with you. Mini Star says, I was told many random things about jinns. Yes, many random things. Between Al Maghrib, between the subcontinent and Africa. Subcontinent is the only not the only one that gets bad rap. Africa also has serious jinn. They deal with the jinn. What exactly is considered a ru'ya? A ru'ya saliha is a true vision and a true dream which comes to a person. It tends has to have certain attributes. Number one, it's short. It's memorable. It's composed of symbols. And a dream interpreter can tell you that this is a true dream. Okay. Maham is here after her concussion. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Her and Mini Star are going to have a discussion on WhatsApp later on, apparently. Legend says, What's the name of the book we're reading? It was Asbab and Nuzul. And then we went to the tafsir of Al Bakhawi. Melody 21, you will find most of them ungrateful. Yes. Um, hey, uh, Rai, do you want to have a Telegram group for for nothing but facts? And then Arcview will be on WhatsApp. Think about it. Telegram. Yeah, Telegram group would just have all sorts of MBF updates. Does everyone have a Jin Qareen? Yes. And this is an extremely important question. The Jin Al is that is assigned to you is called al qareen he lives with you he knows you inside out he has an abode right here in your heart he can live with you he's not affected by dhikrullah he's protected from dhikrullah you can do as much dhikrullah he wants he, he's protected from that as opposed to all other shayateen they're not protected from that and the question came up when Sheikh Nuh Hamim Keller asked his Sheikh Abdul Wakil al-Durubi he said, when we say that shayateen hate dhikrullah and are burned by the remembrance of Allah, do we mean that, that they're just disgusted by it in the way a secular Muslim would be? Or do we mean that they're literally injured by it? Sheikh Abdul Wakil al-Durubi said, no, they are literally injured by it. So then we ask the question, how then would anyone who does ibadah ever go astray? If you do a lot of dhikr, you put a lot of dhikr, you should never go astray. But we see all the time people who do a lot of ibadah, they go astray all the time. He said that is because the qareen is the only jinn who is not affected by your dhikr. And his, he has the capacity to whisper into you even while you're making dhikr. So that's the answer to that question. Now can your, your qareen calm down and enter Islam, yes, that's possible. That happened to the Prophet ﷺ, and that's not a khususiyah. It could be for others too. But the qareen will then gain knowledge on how to lead you astray. So this is why our path in Islam is number one is a path of knowledge first. Then devotion and spirituality and ibadah. Then service. Anytime you see someone doing service without the other two, he will screw up and go astray. Guaranteed. All those people who said, we want to be activists and we want to do this, that, and the other. Hold on a second. Do you, do you study? Do you go to masajid? Do you purify yourself? 
they don't do any of that stuff, but they want to be activists for Islam. They start off good, then they very easily are led one way or the other, astray. Anyone who is just in ibadah, dhikr, I just want to be a Sufi and blah, 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 blah. Okay, do you study? No, they're going to go astray. Okay, So you need to have all three. And you can't do knowledge without any action or ibadah. That too is munafiq. It's like these academics, study, 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 but do you do anything about it? Do you act? Do you reduce pray? No. It's just an academic exercise. And in my view, there's no such thing as Islamic studies academics just as a career. That means nothing. You must have a motivation. Either you are trying to undermine this religion, you got some deep motivation, or you're a believer in it. There cannot possibly be a third option. I just can't imagine. Yasin, can you imagine someone devoting their life to like Taoism and taking a, a seven, sometimes eight year PhD? And at the end of that PhD, you're going to earn $65,000 a year, pennies, to be a Taoism professor and get disrespected by kids in their PJs who don't care about your class. Right? Why? You are weird if you do this with no motivation, something is wrong with you. You must have one or the other. You are a Taoist and you love it and you believe in it or you're trying to undermine it. Now, Taoism, no one needs to undermine it. It's not a movement in the world that anyone pays attention to. Islam, Judaism, the Bible, right? All those Bible study classes were taught in that, at least from my experience, by people who hated the Bible. They made fun of the Bible. They were not religious people who taught the Bible classes. The Judaism classes were all practicing Jews. They controlled their department. Good for them. Like the Judaism class that I took at Rutgers, just using myself as an example here, it was taught by like an old man who was a good Jew, I guess, who knew a thing or two, and he wanted to teach a course, right? And they hired him as an adjunct professor at Rutgers, to teach a Judaism course, okay? Islam was taught by one guy who loved Islam, genuinely. He was, had his own, checked his own path in Islam. Who knows if he's even valid. But he loved Islam. The other one hated Islam. A Persian atheist named Professor Zaman. And the other professor, I can't remember his name, but he genuinely loved Islam. Islamic culture, Islam. He was a Desi, right? Born and raised in England. He loved Islam. You could tell he loved it in his own way, right? Probably would consider him a Mubtada. But nonetheless, he, he falls on the side of someone who loves this thing. That's why he's devoting his time to it. Forget Orthodox or, in, or not. So you can't have a non-Muslim teaching the Quran, being an expert at the Quran. How are you? In, why? Why would you do this? Why would you spend all your time on this and you don't make money? I know you professors, I worked in your field and I left it because I wanted to make money, right? They do not make money doing this job, okay? Not real money. You make enough to pay for a livelihood, that's it. So what is your motive? I think we should start calling out these professors of the Qur'an, professors of early Islam, of, the, of Islam. What's your motive if you're not a Muslim, if you don't love this thing? Can we start calling them out, right? What about all the, go and try to get a, be a professor in Judaism right now. Israeli studies. You better be a supporter or you're not getting a foot in the department, right? Judaism, feminism, right? You better either be a supporter, you're one of them, or you're out. I'm not even saying orthodox or not. I'm just saying, like Sunni, I'm, not, I'm saying you either love this thing and you believe it in one way or shape or form, or you are an enemy. Don't tell me that you're in the middle. That is a lie. Someone tell me if I'm wrong about that. But... To me, this is uh, when we were Sheikh I mean, yeah, there was a sister who was talking to him, you know, about like people who were giving her doubts, and she was like, Yeah, but this guy is an expert in Arabic, yeah. And you know, Sheikh I mean, was like, That means nothing, 
like Arabic is just a tool. Yeah. The guy can know everything about Islam that is on paper. Yeah. But like these Arabic itself, this is just a tool. And if you use Sheikh Amin said you can have all the tools to build a house, mm -hmm. but no, like you doesn't mean you have a house. Doesn't mean you know how to build it too. Or you don't know how to build. You just have yeah. a bunch of tools in your hand. That's you have a bunch of tools in your hand, and you got all the manuals, and all these people studying. And I go back to say, what is your motive? You have to have a motive. This is not science, like in a sense of like, I can just fulfill a function in society, right? Like a lobotomist, right? I could I could take blood tests. Do I love blood? No, but I can take a blood test. And I could get paid for that, right? This is not a a a uh, fun, a utilitarian skill or a utilitous skill, I should say. This is not a utilitous skill. That hey, everyone, I I learned Islamic studies. I can get a job anywhere now. No, it's not the case. There, are, firstly, there's like half a dozen jobs in the whole country. How many Islamic people colleges are going to hire a full time Isl Islamicist, as they call them? Or Islamic studies professor. You can probably count them. Right? They'll just hire an adjunct to teach Islam 101. And they may even teach three or four classes. Who cares? It's adjuncts. But full time. You can count them. They don't pay greatly. So what, what is your motive? You're either undermining this thing or you, like, you love it. Okay? And if you love it, then go to its logical conclusion and become a mu'min. Let's go back to marriage questions here. What is Zawaj al Urfi? A Zawaj al Urfi, it's not a thing in the Sharia. It's a, it's it's a expression that used in Arab countries to mean a Shari marriage, rather than as opposed to the official marriage with the state. That's what it means. No, Zawaj al Urfi is a Shari marriage. Between it with an imam. And as zawaj al madani is with the state. Okay. You have relationship advice for married people? Yes. If you see, take the advice of the Prophet, if you see something that you don't like of your spouse, push it away from your head and look at what you do like. There's no doubt that you cannot find two people who like, you, you cannot find one person in which you like 100% about them. It's just not going to happen. So when you look and see, I notice the thing that I don't like, turn your eye away from that, look at what you do like. And repeat that. Repeat that until you no longer see what you don't like and the thing that you do like has been expanded because you keep watering that plant and not watering the other plant. You have two plants here. Don't water, speaking of plants, we need to water these plants. Yasin, can you water the plants when we're done? Not now, when we're done. That's... that's uh, little potter thingies right there but these things that happen in your head if you water one of them it grows if you don't water it it dies so keep watering what's good eventually they will fill up it'll fill up your consciousness and what you don't like you never talk about you always push it away of course we're talking about things that are not negatives in the relationship so for example if your wife always interrupts you you can't say, oh, well, I'm going to ignore that. No, because that's something that can be worked on. We're talking about things that cannot, that are not changing. Things that are not going to be worked on. Okay. Can a person, uh, Masitim Sidi says, can a person who gone out of their way of, the, of Islam be influenced by the Qareen? Of course. 100%. That's his job. Qareen's job is to lead you astray. But also Allah has given you an angel that's with you 24-7 to lead you to the right path. There's a girl, she likes to go to the graveyard and read and draw, but she draws devil faces. <sighs> She's got problems. I'm sorry to tell you that. It sounds fishy. Anyone who goes to graveyards and comes back drawing devil faces, you need to uh, get help. It's above my pay grade, sorry to say that. Not above my pay grade. If I could do it if I wanted to, but I don't want to. I don't want to go that realm of studying the jinn. You can study the jinn world if you want to. Any of us can do that. You can find someone and keep their company and learn from them. 
Muhammad Munam. I'm finding it hard to come to terms that Sayyid Aish, Sayyidina Ali had armies that attacked one another. Because you're finding it hard to come to terms with because that's not what happened. There were not armies prepared. Sayyidina Ali was moving with his peop government to Kufa. Sayyidina Aisha took some Sahaba with her to go and block him, to convince him to come back and to prosecute the killers of Uthman, Sayyidina Uthman. So there were not two armies coming to attack each other. And what ended up happening in the nighttime, they, they had the killers of Uthman were actually in the camp of Sayyidina Ali. The killers of Uthman were hidden in the camp of Sayyidina Ali. So they saw that if this conversation goes well, they're in trouble. So what did they do? They went in the, on the cover of night and they killed some of the people of Sayyidina Aisha's side. And they went to Sayyidina Ali's side they killed some of his people. So when Fajr came up, they both saw that they had been attacked. So they both came out, and you, it's not even a battle of the camel. It was a skirmish, right? It was a skirmish, like when CNN caught clashes, right? It was just a skirmish, and that was it. So that's why you have find it hard time grasping that, because you're, what you perceived was not correct in the first place. All right, Masita Msidi is saying again, can I ask her mom to make dua for her? Yes, and you can make dua for her too. The girl that gone and get influenced by devil fascination. Yes, you should definitely make dua for such a person. And if you can, they should lock her in from going to, to the graves. And they should put the Quran on and the Adhan on until it purifies her from all that nonsense and, and, de and demonic... Uh, stuff the the church of satan is making moves now church of satan they're making moves and they're getting recognized and their pentagram and their bamafet or whatever they call their uh, bamafet that goat image of satan with a goat face and horns and and the body of a man is now going to be put up alongside the christmas trees everywhere and the Star of David and the Crescent Moon and all that stuff. They're making moves. It's the New York Times. We'll read that on Affairs of the Moon. We're also going to read about the Islamic study, or the art professor, who showed a painting of the Prophet them. I have to say, innocently, <coughs> she showed it with no malintent as history. And then there was a Muslim student there who has speaking in this woke language, goes around her back, creates a firestorm and gets the lady fired. The poor lady, okay, she did something, we know that's haram. You could have told her politely, right? No one approached her. No one raised their hand in class. No one came after class. And she said, I have no intent. I'm not showing the Charlie Hebdo cartoons here. I'm not showing a bad cartoon. I'm just showing Persian, like, art, Right? My opinion, this whole thing went down the wrong way. And the administration fired her and said she's Islamophobic and said she needs training. Where's Islamophobia in that? She did something that is wrong in our view but was definitely not meant to hurt. Where is the Islamic way of, com of doing things right? Right? Fir'aun called himself Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, billah. And Musa was commanded, say a gentle word to him, right? Not like off with his neck right away. No. I personally felt that this thing went down the wrong way. The right way was to say, private, go to the office hours and say, you know, that this is a little bit offensive to us Muslims because it's haram for us to depict the messenger, peace be upon him. I would personally prefer it if this wasn't shown in class, right? By the way, She's not a Muslim, even if she shows it in class, right? For you, that's all you can do. All you can do is say, we would prefer. It's almost like saying it's cooking class. I go to a non-Islamic university, and I'm taking a cooking class, and they're serving pork and wine. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go to them and say, excuse me, can you not show pork and wine? They have their full right to say, excuse me, we don't share your morals, right? Leave. But in this case, even if the dean had said, no, well, 
we are being respectful to the Islamic tradition. We're only bringing a painting drawn by a Muslim. We're not held to your standards, right? But we're held to the standards of respect. That still would not be Islamophobia to me. That would not be an agenda against Muslims or an attempt to insult the Prophet, right? This person isn't a Muslim. So what is the standard for them? Respect, cultural respect. So I'm not bringing you Charlie Hebdo. I'm not bringing you a cartoon that makes fun of the Prophet. I'm bringing you what your own civilization produced. And they went and got some Persian picture of the Prophet. It was haram. But some Persian did it out of love of the Prophet in the haram, right? But they did it, okay? So from their secular perspective, they're being totally respectful. Me looking at that attitude... You are not equal to the people who made the Charlie Hebdo cartoons about the prophet. There's no way you're equal. You're not equal. It's an unfortunate situation, in my view. But is it some Islamophobia that I got to get this poor woman who's an adjunct professor? They don't make... Now, I said that full-time professors don't make money. These people don't even make... They barely make rent, adjunct professors. And now... That's how we Muslims have treated that person who made a, something that we consider haram, but they didn't have any intent to injure or hurt the Muslims so or insult the Prophet, peace be upon him. She's not held to our standards of halal and haram. She's held to the standard of respect. That's it. Right? SubhanAllah. That's, that, we're going to read more about that on Wednesday, Affairs of the Ummah. We have some Wahhabi Mantik. We have what? Wahhabi Mantik. Wahhabi Mantik, where is it? Read it to me. An Athari or Wahhabi asked an Ashari, Allah is Wujud. Allah That's is Wujud? Uh, Allah Wujud. Oh no, is Allah Wujud. Yeah. And he, Ashari said yes. He asked, are you Wujud? He said yes. But it, it's a different existence than Allah. Yeah. The Wahhabi said, likewise, Allah has a hand, but it is different than ours. Mantik 101. Mantik 101. <laughs> First of all, let's go to Arabic 101. And the, uh, the right expression is mawjud, not wujud. Wujud is existence. So I don't say, are you existence? I say, do you exist, <laughs> right? Hal anta mawjud. Are you, you exist? Okay. Okay, you want to say Allah has a hand? Fine. Negate physicality to it. Negate materiality to it. Negate that it's a limb. Right? You must negate those things. You must negate those things. Okay. Because Sheikh Amin gave us two great points too. Yeah. Like number one, Imam Ahmed prohibited the translation of these things. SubhanAllah. The mutashabihats. Yeah. And two, that's not necessarily like the problem that we have with them. The problem is they're taking every single thing literally. You can't do that. They are making the aqidah out of the mutashabihat. Yeah. They're taking the mutashabih and making it the aqidah. Whereas the mutashabih is interpreted in light of the muhkam. And the muhkam is that Allah Ta'ala is munazza an al zamani wal makan. He's munazza, transcendent beyond time and place. And materiality. Al jismaniyah. So you interpret the mutashabih based upon that. That's muhkam. Why? Because he's the creator of time and place. If he's the creator of time and place, how could any of the elements of time and place apply to him? If he's their creator, and he existed, and they didn't exist. It's a very simple understanding. He announced that he created all of these things. Therefore, their factors and their elements and their qualities... Do not apply to him. Simple equation. Allahu samat. He has no need. If you're saying he has a limb, you have a limb because it's a need. If he has a, a body, he has matter, he's composed of matter, that's a need. If he's in a location, then he's subservient to that location. Right? Got to repeat this over and over and over. Do you recommend Tafsir al-Baydawi? I've heard many good things about it. Lily Rose, how can we know if a jinn is affecting us? La adri, Allahu alam. 
the Hak Knight is sick. May Allah give him a speedy shifa. Hamza Hussein is sick. Was what was Hamza Hussein saying? He's sick. He was asking for a dua. Is he sick or what? Ease. May Allah make things easy for you. Um. Then you recite Ya Latif. Is Shams in Ma'arif a book of black magic citing the jinn? No, it is a book of white magic, which is haram. All of it's haram for us. It is a using Muslim jinns to affect other people. If you're enjoying this live stream, then go to patreon.com forward slash Safina Society to become a patron of this live stream. Are there dangers for a Muslim man working at a cemetery? I don't a Muslim cemetery? I don't believe so. It's probably going to increase him in thinking of death, right? The Muslim, the non-Muslim who worked at our cemetery in Route 33, he became Muslim. Yeah, he became Muslim. If I want a protective widow to take effect for the day, must it be recited before or after Fajr? Well, if you recite it right, you recite it right after Salat al-Fajr. And it protects you for the day. If you, let's say, don't, and you recite it at, let's say, 10 in the morning, then you have the protection from 10 in the morning onwards. Ishaq says, what do I do if I still have particles of food during my mouth in prayer? If you swallow it, there's no harm, as long as you're not consciously trying to eat it. It's just a particle and you swallowed it, and it's already inside your mouth. KS13, is it permissible for men to wear a ring made of anything besides silver? Yes, it is. You can't wear any ring that is not gold. Muzammil Khan, is reciting Salah and Salam beneficial for solving financial issues and crisis? 110%. You recite 100 times something like Salah Tunjina or Salah Kamila. In the last third of the night, you'll find a, a lot of, a lot of relief. Immediately. Like the next day, you'll get some relief. Can you talk about Waswasa? Waswasa is either from Shaitan or from the Nafs. The waswasa, what's the difference? The waswasa of shaitan is always different. It's to get you to fall into a different sin. The waswasa of the nafs is the same waswasa. So that means it's a psychological thing. So for example, if I have waswasa that I don't have wudu all the time, that's from myself. It's not from shaitan. Like every day I have that waswas. You're called muwaswas. Your, your job is to ignore it completely. If you have waswasa, to do something wrong, your job is to remember Allah and that shaitan will go away. And waswasa about doubts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe from shaitan, maybe from your qareen, but it is upon you to seek knowledge. You seek knowledge. Hmm. How to remedy or find out if a bad jinn, okay, we, we looked at this. I really, you, you, you have to go to a righteous pious, well-renowned scholar who is a jinn doctor. They do exist, but you make sure that he's renounced. He's known amongst the scholars. The scholars of fiqh, of aqidah, they know him, they know he's sound. That is going to be your recommendation. How am I going to recommend you somebody? I need to know that others recommend him. That's how we verify. Like if you see a, a scholar at the same table and Sheikh Amin has invited a scholar, right? You know automatically that scholar, he's vetted, right? The scholars vet one another all the time. That's, that's the value of scholarly meetings. They always meet each other. It's to keep us on the right track. Rumaysa says, what could we do to close the veil of, jinn, of the jinn world for someone who has started to see jinn several times? Ask Allah Ta'ala to close it for you. And that dua that you do will lead you to the sabab that will close it for you. Yellow Mellow, are there any dangers for a Muslim man working in a cemetery? We'll answer that. Melody 21, how would a jinn appear in a dream? Can it have a human form with a dark present and then disappear? Allahu Alam, but, it, Allah Alam, but it's possible. For example, a nightmare. A nightmare is that a jinn was able to attack you. That's a nightmare. That's what we call a nightmare. And you, you wake up, you're not supposed to repeat it. Okay. 
All right, like the stream, share it with your friends, be a supporter at patreon.com forward slash Safina Society. Thank you, Sophia, for the reminder. Redstone, is it permissible to marry a female jinn and have children? It is not permissible for the simple reason that it came to Imam Malik's time, and he said, yes, I have come across marriage between human and jinn, but I forbid it because this would allow a warm woman to go around pregnant, and she will say, it will be said to her, where is your husband? And she says, he's unseen. And this will open the door to any woman getting pregnant and saying, my husband's unseen. Now, what does this have to do with uh, in terms of today's day and age? It does. We do use that. Muftis have used, Madiki Muftis have used that um, incident to forbid a woman from using a, um, uh, a fertilized egg of hers that is, let's say, in a storage bank somewhere. It's fertilized. All they have to do is put it in her womb. But the husband dies or she's divorced from him. So she's no longer married to that man, either by reason of divorce or death. So she's a single woman. Can she go to that bank, get the fertilized egg, and have it them insert, insert it inside of her? No. The answer is that's haram. Because it would lead to this issue of a woman walking around pregnant without husband or without a husband. Okay. So that would be that is why it's forbidden. Okay. Uh Masid is saying, can you please? investigate the youtube marvelous quran the person who does the translation is dr hani achen any the way his way of interpretation is confusing all right we'll look into it and see what he's all about is you saw him arabic or english mm. that's always trouble Okay, he's been. Is he like? There is a man named who's pretty popular. His name is um, what is it? Adnan Ibrahim. That man is way off. Like he's way off. He has stuff that's kufr, completely. Okay. That's kufr completely. Shima is saying if someone thinks they're affected by a jinn, I'm telling you. Recite the Quran, recite the Awrad, and go seek consultation from the upright and well-known fuqaha who have an interest in the subject matter. In, in, Amer in, in our area, you can find them in Queens, Queens, New York. And you can find some here in Central Jersey. Azimandias says, is there an ayah that talks about saying something is haram when it's not? I think you may be referring to Don't say this is halal, that's haram without knowing such that you'll be lying about Allah. Maybe that's what you mean by that. Or maybe he means abrogation. That something that's saying that something is forbidden but it was abrogated to be made prohibit, permitted. Okay. Um... Is there such an abrogation of saying a verse of prohibition that has been abrogated to become permitted? That's a good question. Do you remember anything like that, Ryan? Something that the Quran has forbid, forbade, yet later in another verse it permitted. Oh, Adam. Well, we'll have to think about that. Diana says, what is a good response to give when asked, what is the wisdom of women wearing hijab? What is the evidence that it is fard? The evidence that it is fard is in Surah Al-Nur and Surah Al-Hujura, uh, Al-Ahzab. وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنْ The khumur is the head covering, right? عَلَى uh, The jayb is this. So, in the past, as the Mufassirin mentioned, is that the Arab women used to wear a, a head covering to block the sand coming onto their hair. Or for, it was just a cultural thing, who knows, maybe both, that you'd cover that and you would throw it over your back. And in many farm countries, the Muslim women still wear hijab like that. 
but the Quran came and mandated that you pull it over your chest to cover your chest and your neck. All this is to be covered as well. So the uh, hijab is not complete if it just covers the hair. It has to also cover the neck and the chest and the and the breasts, basically. So that's the ayah of Surah An-Nur and the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When he was asked, "What is she?" Was, a woman asked, "What is permitted?" He said, "You may show the, this, everything except this and this. This uh, it's just to be covered." On top of that, it's one of those things that does not really. We can we have the textual evidence, but we can go beyond that. Every, what were the Sahaba's moms wearing? What were the Sahaba's wives wearing? What were the Sahaba's daughters wearing? From then all the way till now. So when the fuqaha and the scholars of Islam are writing, this is the what the hijab is, it's not just on textual basis, right? It's what are all the women wearing? What it, When I go to study with my teacher and she opens the door, let's say, or I go in and she's in the house. My sheikh's wife is in the house. What's she wearing? Right? This stuff is, it's one of those things that is almost impossible to change because the whole society was doing it and that's the power of the hujja, the hujjiyat of Amal al Madina. The idea of the Amal al Madina being a proof. The hujjiyah is the reason it's a proof. It's a source of evidence. It's because certain things, the whole society is doing them. The scholars, the non-scholars, the rich, the poor, everyone's doing them. The new Muslim, the old Muslim, like how many times do we pray? What does the adhan sound like? What does fatiha sound like? What do you wear? What's halal to eat? What's haram to eat? Like it doesn't take five minutes in Islam to learn that it's pork is haram. It literally doesn't take three days as a Muslim. You're going to know that. Hanging around to any Muslims, you're going to know that. You're also going to know how many prayers there are. What is a Muslim woman supposed to wear? All these things. So that's that's the answer to that. Okay. And as for what are the wisdoms, what do we tell the non-Muslim? Well, you ne- first of all, you're never going to make them happy. He doesn't believe in the source in the first place. This is not ma'qul al-ma'na, 100%. On one hand, we could say, yes, Allah did mention the wisdom in the Qur'an so that you don't be bothered. And I- I'm telling you that it is that is a wisdom. A woman who covers herself... Her, the attractiveness that would cause someone to bother her has now been blocked maybe 75%. There's no doubt about it. There is no doubt that someone who you can't see their form or their figure, nor their hair, right? You've covered 75%, 80% of their attractiveness. It's covered. So you're not going to bother this person, right? You're not going to stare at them. You're not going to go after them. That's one of the wisdoms. And other than that, it's ta'abudi. It's just this, just how Allah is testing us. That's how Allah asks us to do this. And by the way, hijab was never an issue until the last few centuries. Maybe w- one century even. You go back, even in Victorian England and their culture, their women covered their bodies and covered their hair. But every era has its fitan and its trials and its tribulations. Every culture will go away from the Sharia in a different way. And that will be the fitna for them. I told you this story before. Down in Ethiopia, we're going to get that brother on to tell the story himself. The fitna there is the Sharia's limitation on a man having four wives. That's the fitna. And who's angry at it? The women, right? The women say, oh, we love Islam. Everything is good about Islam. But we're, I'm 10 of 10, th- 10 wives. I'm the 10th of 10 wives. So you're telling me where is the mercy of the Sharia that he has to divorce six of us? Upon entering Islam, he has to divorce six of you, right? They say, where's the mercy in that? Where are we supposed to go as women? Who's going to feed us? Who's going to protect us? That's what they're saying. So every culture will have its issues with the Sharia. Ishaq says, is my salah valid if I... Sa- uh, is it, is my, does my thing go up or, or are the questions being repeated? Nida, I used to feel a lot of resistance towards making dua and prayer, but since I started tuning into these live streams, I look forward to it, to talking to Allah and connecting my heart in dua. That's the purpose of these live streams. That is the purpose. And anybody would 
people would not want to make dua if they are treating Allah as if he's a human. Oh, I'm bothering him again. I'm asking him too much. He's not, he's going to let me down. He's going to forget. These people may not say these things, but in the back of their mind they think it, right? I'm being selfish. You you can approach a human being and you ask him that something and that human being will say, "Listen, I know you're you're only being nice to me because you want something." But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to do that to, to, for him. He's telling us to do that for him. Because he knows that when you enter this route, you will develop. So he's, he is luring you. Either I'll protect you from, from fear or get, give you the things that you like of this world. Just do it. Just get involved. Okay. Abdullah, what is Abdullah saying here? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, with the Quran and the words of his prophet, I guess he's saying protection from the jinn, I suppose. Yes, of course. The Qareen is specifically, we need, we need knowledge. Ilm bil aqidah. What is your opinion on the Mahdi? We believe that there is someone who's going to come and rally the Ummah back together and he is Al-Imam Al-Mahdi. And his presence will end many of the sects. They will, they, will, they, will, they will be brought to an end. Many of the Shia will believe in him. The Prophet ﷺ is the best of examples. No books needed. The Prophet tested and tried bringing Islam a new concept to his nation and his family, not concerned about how it affect them. Meaning, yes, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not learn from human beings. That's what I think she means by saying no books needed. He did not need to learn from human beings. Are there any dangers? Is it me or the question is repeating or are they, am I scrolling up? All right, I got a question for you. All right, go ahead. Does Surah Al-Jinn hurt the bad jinns? Did Surah Al-Jinn hurt the bad jinns? Well, the Quran in general, if it's recited, the demons have to run away. It's, it's toxic to them. They get burned by it. It's fire to them. Uh, all right, I'm going to take this question. Ixiros, whatever, says, what is the Islamic ruling on Botox fillers? They aren't permanent, so is it allowed? I'm not, I don't want to offend anybody here, to, to be quite honest with you. I really don't want to offend anyone. But it just goes to show when human beings intervene in the creation. Um, we said earlier, when it comes to all plastic surgeries are halal, if they are putting back what you lost. Okay? It's fine. I lost something. I lost a piece of skin. You can graft a piece of skin on. My nose broke. You can fix it even if that means a whole new nose job, fine. Let's say your nose got smashed, okay? And the doctor said, this is going to be a nose job. Your nose is not going to look the same. It's going to look better. I don't know what's that Fine. It's a gift from Allah. But when you start doing this Botox, what I notice, the people look the same. They lose their unique look. And Botox, I really don't want anyone to be offended. Don't be offended, please. Because there are pious Muslim women who have done this. Maybe they did it not knowing it's haram. Maybe they just had a moment of weakness. They went and done it. They, the face looks the same. The forehead looks the same. The lips look the same. The cheeks all look the same. You get 10 women that Allah created all unique when they have Botox. Are we lying to ourselves? They all start to look the same. So I'm appealing to you from a perspective of the effect of it. It's not a good effect. The effect of it is not what you may want. It's not even a good look. Right? It's not a good look. They end up looking like the exact same person. So that's from the one perspective. The second perspective is that it is forbidden because it is not, it is not fixing something that was damaged. Okay? 
if a woman's hair starts falling out, she can fix that, right? If a, um, by the way, I'm an expert on this subject now because ever since we shaved our heads and we talked about it, texted about it, all of my YouTube ads and my Google ads are about uh, all the stuff for losing your hair. But all of those things are losses that you can remedy. You can remedy losses. This is not a loss. Nothing was lost. What came out of your body that you need to put back in, right? That's why it's forbidden. Because if we open that door of that, that door, the Sharia gives us a very generous door. Anything that is a birth defect, which we would all agree is a birth defect. Someone's, for example, teeth is crooked or nose is bent or broke their nose or has a, like a mole here or a, something here on their face. They can fix all that. That's very generous of the Sharia that's it once we go into the door of reconstructive surgery just for the sake of cosmetics that door must be closed the sharia closes it it's not my rule it's the rule of the sharia good did we cover everything on that right sheikh you might need to check user tahira's question on youtube fine tahira you have an advocate Let's see what Tahira says. Oh, we've already answered it. She also asked, can jinn hurt animals? Jinn, Allah Adam. If they can hurt animals or not, I believe they may have that ability. They just may not have the interest. Typhoon says, we often repeat our questions when it takes a long time to them to get answered. That's why I keep seeing them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. They're cooking downstairs. Dominican food. Aniqua. How to deal with anxiety that disrupts one from major decisions and important tasks. I've been praying, doing dhikr, doing tahajjud. Well, salah on the Prophet must remove anxiety. That is a promise from Allah, from the Prophet. Okay. And you may need to get psychological you know, therapy. Maybe it's something in your thinking habit, right, that's stopping you. So don't deny, I don't deny the validity of the psychiatrists. Then we're not going to say all of it's just nonsense, no. What I do think is nonsense, and I do think is, is um, a scam, is when you have a therapist and you go and you complain and talk all the negatives to the therapist, and you just have to do this every week. Well, wouldn't the therapist be failing at his job if he or she is no long, is, is, is not curing you or helping you? Like, okay, I saw my therapist for a year, now I'm done, I'm good to go. That's how it should be. Six months, he walked me through it, right? He taught me how to be a positive thinker, things like that. Yeah, that's what it seems to be. It's just you're venting, 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 and he's billing, 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 right? <laughs> that to me, why I think it's a scam. Shouldn't he have helped you? Okay. Okay. So that's how I look at it. And sometimes you have to just look at the thinking, the mentality of the thought. Like, if all your words are always negative, right, and you're always talking about what's bad, that's probably why things are bad, right? Because you're constantly thinking, okay, about what's bad. That's why things are bad. So we answered Tahira's question. Ryan said, I'm just going to go back to make sure, just to triple check. Here's what the question was. Does Surah Al-Jinn hurt the bad jinn? The Quran, all dhikrullah hurts them. Even if a Christian was to say God, Moses, Jesus, that would hurt them. The names of Allah and His Messenger. Okay. Ultimus Minimus from Latin class says, how do you tell the difference between the many names of the Prophet Muhammad and the characteristics that people use to describe him? Well, the Prophet ﷺ, he described himself with five names and the Qur'an 
addresses the Prophet in many names. Ya ayyuhal muddathir, ya ayyuhal muzzammil. Then after that, it's descriptions. So a name, the proof of the name is either the Prophet said it's my name, or that the Quran addresses him with that. Okay? And then everything else is a description. Typhoon says, I also want to get Al Kharid al Bahiya, but can't find a good commentary on it. There's a shop right here. It's cold. My head is cold. There is a shot. There are many Shuruhan Kharid al Bahiya in Arabic, but in English, I don't know how many. What is the adab of saying salam to someone who is with their wife or sister? Assalamu alaikum jamian. Assalamu alaikum in general. That's it. Assalamu alaikum meaning to everybody. Sophia has endless problems with her neighbors. Sophia is from, Bel- I think she's French, but in Belgium, right? But sometimes she goes to Morocco too. So she has issues with her neighbors. And I wonder, I'm trying to think if there was an incident in the seerah, if there was a dhikr with that. Hasbunallah and Amal Wakeed is the best dhikr for that. Lily Rose says, Dinar equals when it is more harmful to jump on the chest to resuscitate. Oh, D-N-A-R. Do not resuscitate. What's the A stand for? Do not automatically resuscitate. Okay. Uh... Fractured ribs. Oh, that's why. DNAR, do not automatically resuscitate this person because they may have fractured ribs. Okay. This is a medical conversation that's happening. All right, Vorage is coming on and saying, is it allowed to switch methods because I like the title of another madhab? No, that's, that's the reason? Then no. SS says, Assalamu alaikum, does crying, we- weeping profusely in your dreams mean anything? Allahu Adam. It may, it, I'm sure it has a meaning, but I don't know the meaning. Ishaq says, can I still do that during the Fajr Salah when I'm fasting? No, if you're fasting, remove it from your mouth. Don't swallow anything while you're fasting. He's talking about something, having something in his mouth and then swallowing it. Typhoon says, I'm a Maturidi, but I only have Ash'ari books like Ar-Risal Al-Qairawani. And Aqeedah, Ar-Risal Al-Qairawani is not even like Ash'ari Aqeedah. It's just a listing of beliefs. And there's even a mistake in it. Okay, which is uh, on the throne by his essence. That's a mistake. We don't say that. Al-Aqidah Shurnubiyya. Can you recommend beginner books for Maturidi Aqidah? I believe that all the beginner's books are the same. If I'm not mistaken, from what I was taught by uh, in my Aqidah studies, the beginning is all the same. Only when you get to the higher level books will you see the differences. Bidaya fi usul al-Din. Hmm. Who's the author? Maturidi. Maturidi? Ajib. I don't know if he was Maturidi. Or at least he wrote a Maturidi book. What is the cure for Ujib with intellect or thinking? Okay. It says V. Well, open a Facebook page, open a Twitter account, and start sharing your ideas. You will get torn down so badly... No matter how good the idea is, your ojib will go out with it. Okay, Sophia is in Germany. She is a French in Germany. Why, uh, why is Ibn Hajar called Al-Hafidh? Hafidh does not mean Hafidh Al-Quran, meaning Hafidh more than 100,000 hadiths. Hafidh essentially is the highest caliber title for hadith. Amir al-Mu'mineen. Subhanallah. Let's go to Instagram, see what's going on here. Anam Lodi says, Botox just gets rid of the fine lines and wrinkles. You can tell when someone has fillers, though. Doesn't look good. Okay, so maybe I mistook fillers from Botox. Okay, but you all got my point. What if when you lose the fresh look with age, fixing... Under the eye bags, for example. 
Um, no, I don't, I don't think that that's, that's the right way to go about things. Um, in the, neither in the Sharia nor in general. And I think that all of this does have to do with us losing perspective of death and life and hanging around or being too exposed to people who care too much about this dunya. I can totally get it if you lost something that your fitrah you were born with, right? I get that. That I totally get. But if you're experiencing something that all of humanity experiences at a certain age, at some point we must draw a line and say, we're okay with death. I'm okay with losing this dunya. At some point we must say that. Now, if you're 90 years old, if you're a woman who's 90 years old and she's losing her hair, I could still get it that she wants her hair. That's fitrah. Allah created you with hair. Okay? But I do have a problem. At some point, there is a spiritual disease that has to do with perspective. The perspective on the shortness and the length of life and where we're headed to. So stop surrounding yourself with lovers of, the, of life, of dunya, and start surrounding yourself with the graves. Visit the graves. Be amongst those who are in the graves. And I have to say, it must be much harder now with the global population the way it is, with the materialism as rampant as it is, it's much harder to remember death, right? There used to be a time when the human population was moderate. So there wasn't a lot of competition for dunya, right? But you have to work harder now and be start meditating more, reading more about the afterlife and the grave. That will calm your... It will completely alter your perspective. So someone who is, becomes obsessed with how they look in an unhealthy way, because there is an acceptable way and an unhealthy way. The unhealthy way, it must be that they're surrounded themselves with people who love this life. And they have not had enough dosage of the remembrance of death and afterlife. So start altering that a little bit, right? And I believe that the winter is a great time to do this because the days get shorter, you get colder, you want to stay indoors, you don't want any of this stuff, right? To go out, you're not in the mood for any of this stuff. And once it gets dark at five o'clock sometimes, right, six o'clock, and you have a long night of darkness ahead of you, sometimes it snows, it forces you in. I think it's the best time to imagine yourself, just close your eyes, imagine yourself, and sometimes there's this nice, some nice qasidas or hums with, or, or, or you know, like uh, poems with some melodies that will really put you in a state like, that's it, Allah, I'm done with life. You will feel yourself become so relaxed. Allah, I'm done. Life is, this is the end of life. And you sit there thinking about that and letting yourself get into that mode of the quiet, just it's quiet, it's dark, us. I lived my life. We're all going there. You might as well prepare for it. The smartest person is the one who prepares for the inevitable, not flees from the inevitable. The dumbest person is the one who flees from the inevitable, right? And I said that about fillers and Botox. I'm going to repeat it again. Do not take offense of what I'm saying. Ah, it makes no sense. You flee from the inevitable and run to what's temporary. I can understand... Under 50, you have that feeling, right? In your 40s even. Definitely 30s, I can understand that. Because in your mind, oh, I got 60 more years to live. I'm going to live 60 more years with this ailment or whatever, or with this image. I can understand that, right? But as time goes on, at some point, you realize, hey, I pretty much cut most of the, I'm done with most of this stuff. My time to the afterlife is shorter than my time that passed. And how to do you? should be relieved. And if you're not, that means you're surrounding yourself with too much Hollywood. You are surrounded. You're bombarding yourself with lovers of dunya. So you're on their vibration. You also love the dunya. So surround yourself with lovers of akhira and the sick and the dying and the elderly to the point that you feel, all right, I'm out. Plus, time's up. In the old days, guy used to take his wife and go live in an old log cabin and, and and just live out their days, right? And they used to have a peaceful time. Go gets the fire, gets the wood, puts in the firewood. She cooks some food. They eat the food. They remember Allah a little bit. They go to sleep. 
they repeat the next day. Very peaceful little living, right? Because halas, game's over on life. You reach 80, halas. You reach 60, 70, you should be thinking like that now. Now, maybe easier said than done, because I personally haven't reached that yet, but that's what one imagines that that's what life is going to be like. And in when it's haram, in what is haram, you have to advance that. How do I know I'm not going to die tomorrow? Why should I worry so much? I might die tomorrow, right? Why should I worry so much about a matter of dunya? Yes, I might try to fix myself up, get myself better in life, and simultaneously decrease my love of life. It's not, it doesn't have to be one or the other. That's the weak person, okay? It can be both. I can be working. I wake up at 4.30 in the morning to work and to earn a buck. And at the same time, I decrease my love of life by remembering death and afterlife. Zaji Kitchen says, Zaji's Kitchen, this is um, a restaurant it looks like. Is having dog as a pet haram? Yes. Sony, can I follow another medheb ruling for fasting and another medheb for salah? We'll do if there's a need, yes. Abdul Wadud, did the two wives, uh, the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, divorce, get married again? Or were they not allowed? La alam, la adri. It's a good question. Very good question, but I cannot remember that. Okay. Can't remember the answer to that. Uh, uh, it's winter now in England. They should all be like ascetics. They should all be in this because it gets dark real early. And it's dank all the time. It's gray. You may have one month of grayness. So you're like, Khalas, I'm retired from life. But the problem is everyone is now running after the dunya so much because it's available. It used to not be. You see the, what the English life used to be like in Downtown Abbey? Remember, Ryan, you had to do the paper on Downtown Abbey? <laughs> right? Because it was all like their servants, and that's their life. Permanently. There's no upward mobility. I'm a servant. That's my life. That how, that's how your life used to be. Today, the pleasures of life are just available in some cheap way all for everybody. So everyone's chasing the dunya. Don't get affected by that. Oh, it's so much. It's not. You'll never get bored. Shaitan and Iblis, he's done the job. He did his job. You never get bored from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. Technology. Every day there's a new invention. The cancer center is a reality. Continuous reflection. Babies to elderly. Does the Qareen influence us in Ramadan? There's a difference of opinion on that. If the Qareen is locked in Ramadan or not. The majority said yes, he's locked. Tahir Omar, someone recently went for Umrah and showed their family that when I die, bury me in this place. After a few days, he died. That's a big karama, really. Go ahead, Ryan. Is not having privacy to expose arms and hair an excuse for tayammum for females? Ooh, we have to ask the fuqaha that question. Yeah, it's a tough question. Yeah, it's three fifteen. We've been going for two and a half, two hours fifteen minutes. About, we will stop right here. Jazakum Allah khairan, everybody. Please remember us in your du'a and remember everyone else who was on the stream in your du'a. May Allah bless everyone here and grant us istiqama and holding fast on the book and the sunnah and strengthen us in the remembrance of death and decrease our love of dunya. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Wal asr inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu aminu salihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haq. Wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Wassalamu